Hi, this is Pat Zelenka. Today we're talking to Roger Humphrey. Alright, I'm Pat Zelenka. Welcome to the show. I'm here with the illustrious Roger Humphrey, a uh, legend in his own mind and in the minds of others. And we're going to talk a bit to Roger. Roger is a classical guitarist. He's been around for a long time and has taught a multitude of talented students. So, Roger, Hi. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me on. You are welcome. Um, so, we were talking once about how you'd started playing. When did you start playing the guitar? 1958. 58? I got my first guitar for Christmas that year. What kind of guitar was that? A K. And it was a little plywood guitar, yeah. and uh, action was just stiff as could be, but... I had a couple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but I can still remember the smell. You know, I oh, opened yeah. up that case like, oh, yeah. <laughs> when I was first playing, that was the thrill. I could smell wood and glue. Oh, yeah. And strings, and oh, I yeah. just thought I was in some hip club, you know, at that point. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, what were your early influences? I think once you mentioned uh, James Burton to me. Yeah. Um, uh, he was, I mean, I'd always loved music and loved listening to music. And, uh, but when I saw uh, uh, the Ozzy and Harriet show uh, and, yeah. and watched uh, Ricky Nelson, the guy next to him, James Burton. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. yeah, I want to be that guy. I want a job where I'm having that much fun. You know, so, and it wasn't so much that I wanted to play like him. I just wanted to play. Sure. You know. Yeah. So, to be involved in it and yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the whole world of it, for sure. We were talking a while back on your podcast, which we'll have a link for below. Okay. But we were talking a bit about Julian Bream. Quite right. A bit. Yeah. And um, the I, I did not remember at the time when we were talking what album it was I had listened to. Okay. But it was uh, the Bach Lute Suites. Oh, yeah. And I had bought that, and I thought, oh, wow, Julian Bream. I know that name from Guitar Player Magazine. So I put that on, and I was hooked by him after that. Charlie Bird, a lot of those people. So... How did one go from James Burton to Charlie Bird and Julian Bream? <laughs> Because I'm sure there's a few people out there that are curious. How well, that it's happened. yeah, it's it's a it's a long way, isn't it? Well, shortly after the whole Ozzy and Harriet show and the James Burton show, um, the folk music uh, mm -hmm. thing took over, and that was a, something and huge back then too. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was massive nationwide. Yeah, Na massive. Well, if you look at popular music in general, and I don't want to get too far afield here. Oh, if you look at right. popular music in general, it, it it comes like a big deal, and then the then the, the corporations take over, and so yeah. we went from from Elvis and doing his early stuff and and Chuck Berry and people like that and so by the early 60s it was all heavily arranged heavily orchestrated and you got Ed Kooky Burns singing baby baby let me your comb yeah. you know or something like that yeah you know? <laughs> And yeah. the, so the last words of that song are, baby, you're the ginchiest. Yeah. <laughs> and you just knew that rock and roll was about death. Almost as fun as listening to Pat Boone sing Tutti Frutti. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just painful. And so, and so anyway, anyway um, uh, the, the folk music kind of came in. And so where the corporations had taken over, the folk music went back to the people again. We could just strum guitars and sing music and do what we do. And then, as you go through the 60s, it went through the Beatles and guitar music became really big and, 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 and such. And then, and then we got into disco at some point and everything got all corporate and got too big and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, through that period through the 60s, um, I was, th th there were still vestiges of this folk music thing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Simon and Garfunkel uh, was, was a big deal, Donovan was a big deal, so oh, on sure. and so forth. And, and Paul Simon's a terrific guitar player. He's scary good. You just don't realize it until you try to do his stuff. And it's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so, and then I, then I, um, 
uh, ran into uh, the music of Jose Feliciano. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard him do his version of Light My Fire, I about fell off the chair. I mean, I was like, yeah. holy mackerel. Well, a couple of years, so then I tried to steal that. I thought, that's kind of going back. I mean, as much as I loved electric guitar, and I really do, I don't have a mind for it. Yeah, you have to go where it, your muse leads right, you. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And so I will sit back and just kind of listen to other people do it and enjoy it, but I don't have that mindset for it. I just can't think in those terms. And, and I never really wanted to be a lead guitar player, as much as I love listening to, and I'll, I'll throw out Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and guys like that back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never saw myself in that role doing that kind of music. And so, uh, but I saw Jose Feliciano on a nylon string guitar, mm -hmm. and it just blew me away. Just, I thought, holy well, He was mackerel. an incredible talent, and people yeah. forget. Yeah. You know, but yeah, his interpretation of Light My Fire is really fantastic, but there was so much he did, and I think Light My Fire was what really opened him up to a larger mass audience. It was huge, yeah. That and was it brought flamenco to the masses. Right, Yeah. right. And so, uh, anyway, I had a chance to meet him in Tokyo in, in 1970, and I, I was at his show, and then afterwards we hung out for a while. And, oh, uh, I'm jealous. And yeah. uh, and so, anyway, I, I, oh, I got to tell you about the show real quick, like, I don't want to go. Oh, no, get, please do. Yeah. But you got him, a bass player, and a drummer, and the bass player is playing an upright on yeah. stage. Three guys in the middle of a barren stage. <laughs> you know, of course, he's blind. For those of you who don't know, and he is. <laughs> he's, he is blind, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. so he he's like this, and he starts. He's sitting on a stool, and he starts counting it off: one, two, one, two, three. And they hit it. And by the time they hit the second measure of the first song, fifteen hundred plus people in this room is doing this. And we did this for two hours. I was exhausted. When I, <laughs> I mean, the rhythm was just so good. The and best just, cardio you oh, can get. Oh man! Yeah. So anyway, so I, I I met him afterwards. And um, uh, and I told him I was trying to steal his licks and I was failing miserably. I bought my first and by that time my second nylon string guitar. So his his suggestion was to, to start studying some classical stuff because he had done that. And so uh, I took a couple of lessons and then uh, life got in the way and I wasn't able to continue. Um, and I was still like strumming and singing popular music at that particular time. And uh, a couple years later, I'm doing more classical and less of that and I stopped performing and just started focusing on the classical stuff when I was about 25 yeah and I, and I stayed that stayed with that till I was 35 I only took about two gigs in 10 years I think something like that focused on teaching focused on just getting my classical chops up yeah and uh, but in that amount of time I had heard it, it's it's a short jump from the, the folk music that I was singing in 1962 to the Renaissance music that we hear oh, in the yeah. in the classical repertoire because it's a lot a lot of it's based on the same, the same. Oh, it's I mean, so interrelated. Yeah, I mean, you take yeah. a look, take a take a song like Green Sleeves, which a lot of people uh, only know as "What Child Is This" at Christmas time. Sure, but that yeah. song's a thousand years old. Yeah, you know that goes yeah. that goes back to like uh, like eleven hundred or you know. Oh it, yeah, it yeah. goes back a long way. Well, you know? pre the Norman invasion. Yeah, you know, <laughs> of England, you know. But so yeah, so so you have all of these old songs and these old these old sonorities that found their way into um uh, well, they found their way into the folk music of that time because a lot of that was folk music, mm -hmm. and then through the migration of people from from Europe, particularly the poor people, into the Appalachian area and so on and so forth, they bring all these songs with them and all of these 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 harmonies and all this kind where of stuff. Where all the fiddling them. comes from, yeah. Those are old Irish melodies and before, you know, so, way way back. Yeah. So I always had a a, a real strong um, affinity towards that music anyway, and so when I got into the classical, that's kind of the thing that drew me. Mm -hmm. And Julian Bream, you mentioned Julian Bream. Um, my, I, I decided I was going to buy a uh, classical album, and the record store didn't have any Segovias. So that was the only only name I knew was Andre Segovia, and yeah. so they had this Julian Bream, and I, I didn't know what a Julian Bream was. <laughs> I didn't even know if he was ma male or female. I mean, seriously, didn't yeah, know. Yeah, well, I know you don't. Yeah. And so, but I did know. It said it was the Bach Lute Suites, and I knew Bach. You knew the Boré through Jethro Tull. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. so anyway, I bought that, and oh yeah, I was hooked. 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 Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, boy, I heard that Boré, and I thought, you know, if I don't learn anything else, I got to yeah. do that one. And I clawed my way through it and learned how to play it very poorly, and didn't care <laughs> because you could play it. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was Loved the thing it. for me. The Boré was one of my audition pieces at LCC for the music program. Really? 
I could I could get so far into it at that time. I was about 17 years old, 18. Ooh, was, it, was it Clickstein teaching that or Mike Karenmuller? Oh, God, this would have been back in the 80s. So it was... Uh, God, I remember that Jeff um, Starr mm -hmm. was the instructor. Oh, okay. And Jeff just, I drove him nuts. I know I did. But he, you know, the idea was to familiarize the student with multiple styles. Oh, yeah, sure. Everything from reggae to classical. But I came in with that and Dust in the Wind. And that was what got me accepted to the program. Because I could play Dust in the Wind. I was having a terrible time with the beret, but I could get so far into it. And they were like, mm -hmm. you sat down in your little cow town and you worked on that. And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, we'll take you. And I thought that was cool, you know, so that was good. But anyway, it's not about me, but that was interesting. So when did you come? Like right now you're doing a lot of teaching. You're doing a lot of gigs up on Mackinac Island. Um, well, how did you get into the Mackinac Island connection without giving away too much? But I mean, well, they just kind of morphed in? Yeah, or? yeah, there's not much, not much to give away. I mean, I still think of myself as a teacher who plays mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a player who occasionally teaches. I, I'm, I, I know people and, like that, yeah. So I am deep down inside of a teacher. Um, after my wife uh, retired from her job uh, working for the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. um, the, the following year she took a, a, a job on Mackinac Island. We had vacationed up there for several years. And oh, so yeah. she got to know people and and uh, we had and so she was offered a job and a pl and and a roommate uh, a lady that we knew and so she moved up there so I was going up there well you know what it's like um, as a musician you're always looking for the next gig oh yeah you know well when I went to back on island I wasn't it was one place where I could be a civilian so I didn't look. I wasn't looking. looking you know? yeah. And and people say, well, when are you going to start doing weddings up here? Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want. I want to come up here and relax. You yeah, know? I just want to come up here and look at the water. Yeah, That's really, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, honestly, yeah. And so, I love that area. And so, so, um, so I went. Uh, I went through that for a couple of years. And then um, one day, uh, about two years later, I was. I was. Uh, I had played. I think one gig on the island at that point. Mm -hmm. Maybe two. And I thought, well, this is kind of nifty. You know, because everything's so close up there. And the one wedding I played was next door to the where our apartment was. I literally walked out of the apartment, walked down. It was less less of a walk than it would be to go to the parking lot and throw something in a car, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I walked over, set up, played, walked back home, took my tuxedo off and sat down and continued reading the book that I'd been reading. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, nice. wow. Yeah. 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 So a couple of years later, I'm driving out by... Uh, 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 where was I? Oh, over by Battle Creek, on the other side of Battle Creek. Okay. Uh, and, and to play a wedding out there. And from where I live, it's a two hour and 15 minute drive. Yeah. So I drive two hours and 15 minutes to play a half an hour wedding and drive back two hours and 15 minutes. And I thought to myself, it's only two hours and 30 minutes from here to the docks, from where I live, to the docks at Mackinac Island. Yeah. If I had gone up there instead, I'd have got paid at least double and I could spend the weekend with my wife. I need to reconsider this policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I talked to a few people that I knew, and I had some help. People, people helped me out. And got There's me. a lot of work up there. Can be. Yeah. If you're willing. If you, but the thing is that that it is kind of a closed society. Um, you've got to be. I, I, one of the things I had to do was I had to join the tourism bureau. Hmm. You know. And I had to take out an ad in the wedding guy because that's how you get people to help you. You become a, with my wife living on the island and am I being willing to participate in the business of the island mm -hmm. in that regard, then I was getting help. Without that, not so much. Yeah. So, well, it is. It is who you know. And it's, yeah, yeah. but it's but it's only fair. They've got, it's, they don't want just everybody coming up there and trying to work because people like that get in the way. They have a standard up there. One of the things that I've always loved about Mackinac Island mm -hmm. is that every vendor up there is at such a high standard, whether it's a photographer. I've worked with photographers who are award-winning and get published nationally. I've seen uh, uh, bakers up there doing doing cakes that will that could make it any food magazine in the nation. Yeah. I mean, it is absolutely top notch, as well as the locales themselves. I mean, service yeah. literally is it is very, very, very important, and it's and so when I go up there, it forces me to be as good as I can be, and then some. Well, it puts yeah, it gets you on your A game for sure. I'm sure, and uh, I know like for me. I've been going up there since I was probably seven years old, uh -huh. maybe eight. 
at the latest. And uh, I know for me, it's always been like a deep spiritual connection to Straits. Oh, area. yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. so much the tourist towns. I mean, I love Mackinac City and I love St. Agnes and I love the island. Mm -hmm. But it's um, just all the places it's you can find up there to do, you know, along Highway 2. And, and so, yeah, when I have gigged up in that area, not on the island, I haven't done that yet, but when I. Uh, have gigged up there in Mackinac City saying like this it's always seemed so strange to me that I was working you know I, I, so I do agree with that for sure well Roger it has been a lot of fun sitting here with you today I wish I had more time but to everyone out there watching the show links for everything Roger are below in the video and we hope you can tune in and tune in next time thanks bye